OWS Week has been going up in the world, visiting Occupy Naperville and Chicago for a brief chat and moved to amend on city council agenda. Then it was back to New York City for Occupy storefront picket support in solidarity with Con Ed workers and Occupy Town Square in Jackson Heights with Casseroles March in solidarity with Quebec and Mexico. To D.C. for an interview with Occupy arrested in early April at BOA Action to Portland for epic rally for housing justice and everybody loves the sunshine. L.A. for the Festival Cultural held at MacArthur Park with March to Mexican Consulate in solidarity with the Yoy Soy 132 movement in Mexico. You can say we've been busy and this occupation is not leaving. OWS NYC members began the week doing one of the things they do best, standing with striking workers for Occupy storefront picket support. Con Edison made over $1 billion in profits in 2011, but the workers who provide cleaning and security make as little as $8 an hour. Con Ed is exempted as a public utility from paying prevailing wages to contracted workers. The company spent $2 million on lobbying in 2010 and 2011 to defeat a bill to remove that exemption, denying good wages and family health care to thousands of workers who clean and secure public buildings. Meanwhile, Conet, president and CEO, earn more than $5,200 per hour in 2011 and owns three homes worth almost $5 million. happening a couple years ago and um, there are many changes that have been going on around the company and um, we kind of knew something would, that something was going to happen this time during the contract negotiation that was different. So about last September I told my people, I'm a shop steward, I said to start diverting some money, 50, 75 dollars a week. And, um, so what happened was is that it ended up we ended up getting locked out. Fortunately, I was able to save a few dollars, but when they cut off our health insurance right away, that scared me, and I uh, I was more concerned about that, uh, the, the major medical portion, because you never know what could happen. I got a family, I had three young children, but uh, fortunately, they have uh, reinstated it at least till the end of the month. So. I'll be honest with you, what it's done for me, it's brought me closer together with the uh, people. Uh, I've been uh, picketing at locations that I normally don't go to. You're getting everybody's point of view. And uh, to be honest with you, the company never thought the union had this much support. And so uh, it's really, uh, they've awakened a sleeping giant here, there's no doubt about it. And so we're, we're, we know, um, you want me to keep talking? I mean, we know that uh, the New York metropolitan area is the center of organized labor in this country. And everybody's watching us. All the trades are watching us. Unions around the country are watching us. We can't, we just can't give in to this. They want to bust the union. Uh, and uh, we just can't let it happen. So um, I'm really inspired by all this. I think it's great. and. Uh, we're trying to lead the way, so and that's how I feel about what's going on.
Michelle Frederick, Local 1 that's Suju WA, Executive Board Member. So we're here at the, the Con Ed lockout on uh, Irving and 15th Street. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how long you guys have been locked out for? We've been locked out since July 1st at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, when, they, when the company ceased negotiations and walked away from the table. Now, what are you guys looking for in your contracts to come back to work, and how long do you hope this? Basically, uh, the three positions, benefits, wages, and of course, uh, our health, our medical. Now, who's, is, who's currently working in place of the, the employees that have been locked out? Has the uh, company been locked out or just specific, specific conditions? The entire company has been locked out and Local 1-2, which is basically the five bars, uh, except Staten Island. Uh, management workers have been doing the work and of course, scabs from uh, Alabama and other divisions uh, throughout the country is coming to help them. Now the current people that are, the current scabs that have come in from Alabama, do they have full rights to work in so that they couldn't do certain no, things? To, uh, legally we can picket them, but if they're working under supervision of management, they can do the work, but they're not going to do it as a qualified uh, workers that we've been trained. They're not trained to do this work. How many people have uh, currently been locked out by Con Ed? 8,500 people as of uh, July 1st. And has there been any, any talks at the table? We've been negotiating. They were negotiated up till uh, last night. And right now, the offer on the table is with our hierarchy. Uh, there's a gag order, so we can't discuss all the specifics. But, uh, you know, it is what it is until we get a fair and decent contract. We will not return. So how long, how much longer are you, are you hoping to be out here for? As long as it takes. As long as it takes. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. to people in New York and around the country that our folks are the first responders that go out and put their lives on the line daily to, uh, supplying electricity, water, and gas and all they're asking is for a fair shake here and Con Ed, very profitable company, a monopoly that profited over a billion dollars last year and all these workers are asking for is just a fair share Con Ed's coming to rip their pension apart and rip their uh, health care apart, and these folks aren't going to stand by it. And, uh, you know, again, this is a very profitable monopoly. And we want to bring awareness to not only the city of New York, but the whole nation. <laughs> Waving you. 
York 99ers continued their stand for human rights at the BDS TIAA CREF, the vast rally, calling on the company to live up to its motto for the greater good and diverse from all its holdings in companies profiting from violation of international law and Palestinian human rights. My name is John Maliska. I'm a volunteer with the organization Women in Black Union Square. Every Thursday we meet in Union Square and we protest against the occupation of Palestinian people. I'm here because this is an excellent effort to encourage TIA prep to divest their money from the building of occupation walls, settlements, and checkpoints. And Boycott, divestment, and sanction, BDS, is a peaceful yet aggressive way of making the world a better place. And I'm very proud to be here today. TIAA CREF is invested in five key corporate players in the Israeli occupation. Northrop Grumman, a weapons manufacturer, Elbit, which makes killer drones, Motorola Solutions, which designs surveillance systems for illegal outposts in Israeli settlements, Eulia, which connects these settlements with a light rail system, and Caterpillar, which provides specialty armored bulldozers used to flatten Palestinian homes. My name is Migna Han. I'm the executive director of Advocates for Peace and Social Justice in New Jersey, Hudson County. <clears throat> I came uh, because I believe in all the, the aspects of this particular action. Now, um, I believe that Palestine needs to be free. I believe that the TIA CREF thing has to stop. And I, I am fully in support of divesting everything from this, the apartheid state of Israel. I'm happy that I was here, that I was invited. I'm honored to have been here, and um, I just can't say enough about how great this action has been. The point of the rally, every time one of these companies profits through U.S. foreign military sales or direct purchase, TIAA CREF and its socially conscious clientele become indirect war profiteers. Across the country, Occupy Los Angeles returned to Solidarity Park, the site of their original encampment. The park near City Hall had been under renovation since the eviction of the protesters' camp. Some say OLA lost its relevance when authorities dispersed them, but their move to Skid Row, the last community where camping was welcomed, led to the protesters exposing the dark side of gentrification private security in public places and the criminalization of poverty to the point that mainstream media was forced to pick up on the story. But the mayor, but the mayor is holding a press conference and won't allow, and won't allow the public, the public, into, a public into a public park. Thank you guys. Members of OLA reunited at Solidarity Park for gentle meetings followed by a candlelit vigil for chalk walk victims of police brutality the week before. The Occupy movement has faced massive authoritarian crackdowns since its inception. Last year, there were hundreds of encampments which became magnets to heretofore hidden victims of economic and social collapse. Communities were blossoming and various races, cultures, classes, and ages were communicating with each other. These visible enclaves, distressed and discarded human beings, could not be allowed to flourish. Government responded with police intimidation, brutality, and arrests. Yet most occupied cases which have made it to court have had charges dismissed. And the 99ers continue building anti-authoritarian communities meeting to discuss racial diversity and economic disparity within the movement itself, using a democratic framework and horizontal leadership to bring about a better world.
Homelessness is rampant in the United States and municipal authorities exert unrelating pressure on homeless camps. Portland, Oregon's occupiers have formed special bonds with Right to Dream 2, known as R2-D2. R2-D2 creates a place where unhoused people can rest or sleep without being rousted by police or private security and without being under the constant threat of violence. On July 20th, around 400 supporters gathered in solidarity with hunger striker Cameron Whitten of Occupy Portland at EPIC rally for housing justice. They listened to mayoral candidates, expressed their skepticism about the electoral process and marched from the park to City Hall to meet with the homeless camp there for a vigil. Yet another example of compassion from activists intent on constructive change. Every 53 minutes, an American child dies due to poverty. How many more are we willing to let die before we act? The theory of housing first states that providing a stable place to sleep significantly enables a person to find employment, recover from substance abuse, refrain from violence and crime, and seek mental health counseling at a lower cost to government. In a progressive and thriving city such as ours, if we were able to adopt such a powerful resolution, we would be more successful and resourceful in combating systemic poverty. Sunday was a big day of solidarity in the global awakening. Mega marches were planned in cities across the planet to show support for the Yoy Soy 132 movement in Mexico with casserole marches as a hat tip to massive student actions in Quebec. Okay. OWS NYC held an Occupy Town Square meeting in Jackson Heights, first taking care of community outreach with signature teachings, art, music and dance, then marching casserole style to raise awareness of the growing education crisis in the U.S. Hey, you millionaires, pay your fair share! You better! Hey, you millionaires, pay your fair share! The Paul Robeson Freedom School is a project that came out of the work of Rodney Dees and myself, Justin Reedus, at Paul Robeson High School, which is Troy's alma mater. He just graduated from there. And we had worked with the students over there to help them uh, run a campaign to save their school. And uh, for about two years, we, we've been working over there. from Ecuador. We are living uh, here in New York, from different parts of the New York, Queens, Manhattan, and... Uh, Was there a name to the dance that you just showed her? Uh, it's called uh, Natabuela in the Inti Raimi. Los Angeles planned Sunday solidarity actions with Yoy Soy 132 as well. A festival cultural took place in MacArthur Park in support of the ongoing massive civil movement in Mexico, protesting the imposition rather than fair election of a new president. The festival was the third protest march to the Mexican consulate and billed as a chance to creatively show the world that the Mexican people and their supporters worldwide do not accept the new president, viewed as a tool of the elite, nor the US government's quick rubber stamped approval of an election viewed as flawed by the people. 
LA Occupies participated in the event as well, and hundreds of participants were expected. Festival mood and turnout were muted, however, by a Saturday night shooting in nearby Anaheim, California, and the subsequent Sunday protest against the Anaheim Police Department diverting many participants from creative dissent to indignant action on behalf of a besieged neighborhood. Anaheim is located in Orange County, notorious for multiple police killings of suspects, usually people of color. Heat seared the city on Saturday evening and people in the neighborhood were outside. Police killed an unarmed man who attempted to run from them. Manuel Diaz was shot and died on the ground unattended. When bystanders reacted angrily, police shot multiple rounds of rubber bullets into a crowd which included women and children, unleashing a canine dog on a mother and child. The incident was unfortunately all too common in the predominantly Hispanic area. Protesters gathered at the police station the next day and tensions were high. An observer might think authorities would take steps to ease the situation. But on Sunday night, Anaheim police shot and killed Joel Acevedo, whose witnesses claim was already handcuffed. Bright lights were trained on citizens trying to film the incident. Authorities and mainstream media have exerted much effort at high cost to quash growing unrest across the United States. The American Awakening began almost a year ago with the aims of educating fellow citizens on economic and social injustice and creating real communities. Occupiers have acted as champions of the downtrodden, have attempted to inspire and unite the 99% and have paid high costs for their efforts. No one thought the struggle would be an easy, short-term venture. However, an observer might wonder why more Americans aren't taking a stand. The poor, huddled masses seem to have one champion who will not turn away. Occupy Wall Street.